And it's all the garlic that you eat. Am I correct? Hint, hint. All right. <laughs> all right. So don't forget that. Uh, t uh, t uh, Friday we're gonna, uh, is her birthday, and then next uh, Sunday we'll have a little party for her. All right? So we'll look forward to that. All right. Let's go, Lord, in prayer, and, and then we'll read our text. Father, thank you so much for this subject. I pray I would do it justice. Help me, Father, to glorify you, and Father, we praise you that you are so real. And I pray, Father, you speak to all of our hearts. I pray, Father, for the unsaved, that they would receive you as Lord and Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You don't have to stand. I'm just reading one verse. That's good? <laughs> you look like you were struggling with this, so I hope you. Thank you, Nick. Always watching out for me. All right, just one verse. In Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. <laughs> so the Bible just declares that there is one true God. It does not uh, argue that there is a God or, or apologize for his being, his existence, or his pres present uh, as the person of all divine perfection an agent of divine acts, but whose will and power all things and persons were created and are sustained. God cannot be defined or described in his entirety. Because he's an infinite, he uh, defies limitations, definitions, and descriptions. Otherwise, he wouldn't be infinite. So in the beginning, God, and God comes right out and says that he created. And uh, he doesn't, again, in, uh, again, introduce himself. He just states this, that in the beginning God created. So the atheist says there is no God. The agnostic says I cannot tell whether there's a God or not. Uh, the materialistic person said what difference does it make whether there's a God or not? It doesn't make any difference anyway. Psalm 14, 1, the Bible says, a fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Now, the reason the Bible says that, he says in his heart, there's no God, uh, you know, he, he's thinking about the idea um, about in his heart. It's not in his mind. He doesn't reason this out. He doesn't think it through. He says in his heart. And the Bible tells us that men uh, uh, struggle with belief, uh, the Bible says, because of the lust of the flesh. And uh, that's why they, they're involved with those things. So in the old days, the turn of the century, the atheist was a type to stand on the street corner and cry to the crowds, I don't believe in God. And um, they were uh, blatant, outspoken, oddballs. Today is different. Uh, he's now is polished, refined, and has a college degree. Uh, you'll find him in the classroom of the universities, high schools, junior high. Uh, he now says that his belief in God is antiquated belief. It's not intellectual or scientific to believe in God. And so he goes on and tells us, uh, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So the thing is this, if you don't fear God, you don't even begin to have knowledge. And uh, I remember we had an English teacher in our classroom. I think it was in like ninth grade, 10th grade. His name was Mr. Bloom. Do you remember him? Yeah, he was a hippie. And uh, he used to smoke pot. It was well known in the school that he smoked pot with students and so on. Um, but he was an atheist and I remember him been in a class one day, and I was lost. I was Roman Catholic. I'm not making myself a hero. And I argued the point that there was a God. And I didn't know God. I mean, I was lost. But I wasn't going was to allow him to just make a blatant statement, there's no God. So, um, and that, that's the role. You should never have a, a teacher like that in the classroom because young people are so impressionable. But anyway, um, 
when you think of scientific, well, it's, it's being scientific is believing we came from monkeys and evolution and this world just happened by itself, then it's, it's uh, in, neither uh, scientific or educational. And Robert Ingersoll many years ago used to draw crowds by saying, uh, there is no God, it's a myth, it's a fallacy of man's mind, a figment of man's imagination, there's no such thing as God. And he would pull out all the watch and pull out his watch while, uh, uh, you know, uh, standing on the platform and saying, I'll put the time watch uh, on God and and uh, and quit, excuse me, and quit if there is a, a God. And uh, if, if I challenge him to kill me in 60 seconds, I'm going to tell you he's not going to. And that would calm a breathless uh, stillness over the audience in 30 seconds or would say uh, God has 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 10 seconds, 9, 8. And what Robert Ingersoll did not know is that God is a God of grace, a God of love, a God of infinite mercy, a God who sometimes allows people like Ingersoll to make a fool of himself and yet give him an opportunity to be saved. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you say, preacher, how, how do you know uh, that there's a God? I have infallible proofs uh, that any intelligent or uh, any open-minded person would realize there's a God. First of all, because of revelation of himself. And the revelation is the word of God. I've read uh, it for 45 years, and uh, I've found no mistakes, no lies, no, no uh, prophecies failing uh, to come true, no promises uh, in the Word of God, but ever uh, fallen on the Bible begins with God. In the beginning, God, and the ends with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. And then in the middle of the Bible, you find the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And the fool did not say it in, in his head. Uh, he did not reason out this idea. He did not come to an intelligent conclusion, but rather out of the depravity of his sinful, rebellious heart, uh, which he would not allow the blood of Christ to cleanse, uh, provide a sa uh, salvation for him. Uh, or for his sinful, fallen nature, he says, there is no God, and he said it because he did not, he did not want to face God. And yet the Bible is filled with verses proving God is real and alive. In Romans chapter 9, verse 26, the children of the living God. In 2 Corinthians 3, in verse 3, the spirit of the living God. In 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 16, the temple of the living God. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, to serve the living God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the church of the living God. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 10, trust in the living God. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, the living God who giveth us richly all things. So at least 10 times in the Old Testament, God is referred to as the living God. In Deuteronomy 5, verse 26, the voice of the living God. In Joshua 3.10, the living God is among you. In 1 Samuel 17, the armies of the living God. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, the reproach, the living, uh, to reproach the living God. In Psalm 42 and verse 2, the Bible says, thirsted for the living God. In Psalm 84, verse 2, the heart and the flesh crieth out for the living God. In Jeremiah 10 and verse 10, he is the living God. Jeremiah 23, verse 36, the words of the living God. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 26, uh, the servant of the living God. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, sons of the living God. All these verses not only tell us that there's a God, but he is a person uh, that is living and, but also that he is a person. He speaks. We have his word. He hears. He answers prayer. He sees. 
He watches over his children. He feels. God knows every spiritual and physical need. Uh, he knows all my ways are constantly before him. Because he lives, I too shall live forever. And you say, preacher, how do you know that there's a God? Because of supernatural revelation of himself. He, he tells us, uh, and the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16, that we have to believe this by faith. We take his word and by faith, we have to believe it. So because of the revelation of himself, second of all, because of creation. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, let's turn there, please. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. And the Bible says in verse 3, uh, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were made of things which do not appear. And uh, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. He that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. So we see here that the world was created uh, and framed uh, by the word of God so that Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So God created, and faith is believing something that you can't see. It takes faith to believe in evolution, to believe that it all took place, that uh, it just happened. And the, and the reason scientists don't agree to the specifics of how the world started, etc., because the simple principle entitled law of cause and effect. That's important. You want to remember that. The law of cause and effect. And this simply means nothing happens uh, in of itself alone. It's invariably the effect of one more uh, uh, proximate cause. From nothing, nothing comes. And that's important to understand when, a, when misled scientists speak about Big Bang Theory they say oxygen and nitrogen, except where they are ready. But where did it come from? There's got to be a cause and effect. But, but Christians believe because the Bible teaches that God always was and always will be, he's infinite and eternal. And this explains everything in our material and immaterial world. Example, God is the first cause. And listen closely. The first cause of limitless space must be an infinite in extent. The first cause of endless time must be eternal in its uh, duration. The first cause of perpetual motion must be omnipotent in power. The first cause of unbounded variety must be om om omnipresent in its phenomena. Uh, the first cause of infinite complexity must be omniscient in intelligence, the first cause of consciousness must be personal. The first cause of feeling must be emotional. The first cause of will must be volitional. The first cause of eth ethical value must be moral. The first cause of beauty must be aesthetic. The first cause of righteousness must be holy. The first cause of justice must be just. The first cause of love must be loving, the first cause of life must be living. Thus, the reason from this cause and effect leads us to conclude the first cause of all things, the prime, prime mover is an infinite, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, personal, emotional, volitional, moral, spiritual, uh, aesthetic, holy, and just, loving and living being. And this, of course, is nothing less than the character described to us of, of the God of the Bible. In Amen. Hebrews, in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. In, the first, uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, creation speaks of a designer, a master builder, a person who put uh, order into the world. I want you to think, I have a couple of illustrations here, so I trust you pay attention. But if you think about 
you know, our lives. So we're talking about human beings. We're interacting throughout the day. We had brunch together and we're talking about the, the past week and uh, maybe a vacation coming up, whatever it was. But there's a whole other world that takes place just with ants. And there are ants on the property. There's ants throughout the world that are, are so organized. And it just didn't happen. So ants live in colonies for their duties and talents are so specific and varied. That is a case of all or none. They must have each other's support and help or perish. And some collect food and bring it back to the nest. Others enlarge the nest home or keep the rooms clean. Still others take care of the queen and growing ants. Nurse ants have the special duty of cleaning and feeding the larva. Also, they move the larva to different parts of the nest if the nurse becomes too wet or cold. Then where, where does the instinct come from? They go to classrooms uh, as young ants. Are they taught this? No. And uh, it, it's an instinct that one ant should perform one task and another different task, and not all choose the same task. Some ants are slave keepers and cannot live without slaves because their jaws are so long and sharp and curved that they cannot dig nest or feed themselves. Without their slave ants to help them, they die. And how did this clumsy mutation survive? Or how did the negative survival of the fittest occur? Uh, it's apparent uh, not by accident and chance. The work of ant re uh, responsibility is to provide food, mainly wood or grass. Soldiers protect the columns of ants, which go out at night and cut grass in the quarter inch lengths and bring them back to stack and storage in chambers. These soldiers make up about 5% of the group, and with a no nozzle in the head for squirting chemicals at enemies. They throw out a gummy substance that tangles the legs and antennas of the enemy and irritates the body. So whatever you do, don't attack an ant colony. You'll have this stuff all over you. If their nest is attacked, the workers begin sealing off tunnels, leading the outside, cementing the new fragments of soil uh, into place. Uh, perhaps these facts are meaningful. Perhaps these things are, did not just happen. Perhaps God, with a supreme intelligence and power, designed and created ants and bees and the homing pigeons and all other amazing assortment of creatures exhibiting such common instincts, uh, instincts as mating and running away and migrating, etc. So you know, there's examples of this just in 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 our of, in our lives, and we've seen them. I mean, I remember as a child, I used to, you know, kick ants and, you know, mess up their their housing and so on. So stupid. I mean, you know, there they are, building this thing, and because of God's creation. And I can give you other examples, but let's move on. Third of all. Not only because of supernatural revelation himself, because of creation, because of answered prayer. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. So God says to call on him. And uh, he said, call on me, and I'll answer thee. That is a great promise from God. Amen. And uh, I know as a child of God, we call on the Lord regularly. Uh, I know our family does. I know a lot of you people pray in the same way, calling on the Lord, trusting God to take care of these things. And then in uh, Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, let's, let's turn there, please. Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says in verse 7, uh, Ask and shall be given you, uh, seek and shall find, knock 
it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that not, uh, seeketh, findeth. And him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So five times in this same passage, uh, one finds, ask God for something, and he'll, he'll, uh, he'll get it. So the idea is that we need to ask. We need to come before God. And there's so many, so many stories that we can read about in the Bible about you know, God answering prayer. The, the parable of the unjust judge. Uh, the, you know, the thought about the man who had uh, five loaves of bread and he comes knocking on his door at midnight. Uh, in the prayer of importunity and all these prayers, but God promises he'll answer our prayers. And I can personally testify that God is real because of personal answered prayer. And I can't tell you how many times over 46 years I prayed and God answered my prayer and I rejoice in that. And uh, I, I pray for so many of you on a regular basis asking God to deal with you, to draw you, to convict you, to, to save your soul. And, uh, and God has answered that prayer. So I, I rejoice in that. Uh, I can tell you this, there was a time where my family and I uh, had a special meeting and uh, the, uh, the visiting speaker left behind uh, someone that we had to take care of for about a month. And when I tell you we were broke, uh, Liz and I couldn't even pay attention. That's how broke we were. <laughs> but, I'm, but the thing is this, is that we, we asked the Lord and, and only we knew about it. No one else knew. No one knew. And uh, a couple of days had passed and we we're asking each other, what are you going to do? There wasn't enough food to take care of, let alone our family. And uh, some guy in Pennsylvania wrote a check out for $500 after God laid him on our hearts, uh, laid on his heart, and he sent us $500. And I'll tell you, when that happened, I was just so happy in the Lord that God took care of us and he met our needs, and nobody knew about it. It's one thing to go around telling everyone about you know, the needs you have and pray for us, you know. But we didn't do that. We, we've never done it. We just keep between us and, and uh, God answered our prayer. And that's happened so many times over our, our lifetime. I, I know there's a God because of answered prayer. The first prayer that God answers is the prayer of salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then fourth of all, because of spiritual salvation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Therefore, if any man... In Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, this point and this point uh, alone explains how I know this is a God. There is absolutely no other solid explanation of my own life made over 46 years ago. And to live this long uh, for the Lord, I'll just tell you that it's, it's a miracle. It really is, and I thank the Lord for that. But it's not me, it's God working through me. And if you're saved by God's grace, you can state that fact. It's not you, it's God working through you. And uh, it's such a supernatural thing. So no human psychologist, mental health organ organization, uh, you know, help the devil uh, possess a man and uh, which was called a demoniac, and uh, that he was counseled you know, to come to Jesus and, and uh, you know, try to do God's will. That didn't happen. He had, a, he had a legion of demons in him, and he cried out to Christ. Now think about that. So you think you have excuses? He had a legion of demons in him, and he cried out to Jesus. And with all these demons, all these wrong thoughts, all these wrong intents, all these wrong motives, and he cries out to Jesus to have mercy on him. And God saved his soul. Next thing you do, we see him in clothed, sit in the feet of Jesus and in his right mind. And that's only the supernatural work of God. And you can go through the Bible, people have been healed, uh, blind people, blind Bartimaeus, uh, other people that were caught in sin and found out and religion 
uh, cannot make this happen. You know, I, I preached a sermon years ago on thinking the uh, Dr. Law and Dr. Grace, and I, you know, went to uh, Dr. Law, and I, I pleaded with Dr. Law to help me, and Dr. Law told me, join a religion, get busy, do what the, the religion teaches you, and so on. And I said, I, I found no hope in that. Law took me to the door of grace, and that's as far as it goes. Why? By the law is the knowledge of sin. And so I couldn't get saved by keeping the law, by keeping a religion. But when I got to the door of grace, that's when my life changed. And that's when your life changed. And so I praise the Lord for that. And that only God can do that. Only God can save a soul. Only God can change a life around. I mean, you think about uh, people in history. Uh, there was a man named Mel Trotter who was nothing but a drunk. And uh, he was in the Chicago for the longest time. And he uh, sold his, his child's shoes to buy alcohol. That's how desperate he was. And finally came to the end of himself and said, I'm done. And he received Christ as Lord and Savior. And he didn't have a problem with the drink. It was God took it all away from him. And that's what he should be. Amen. So we, we see here that God does a work. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Notice verse 10. And the Bible says, It came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinned came and sat down with him and his disciple. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto the disciple, Why eat your, eat your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them that they... Uh, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. And he goes on to say in verse 13, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so you've got to acknowledge, first of all, of what you are. I heard Teddy's testimony early this week, and what a great testimony. God saved that man and changed his life. He said, I got down on my knees, I confessed to God what I was, and I came up a brand new man. And praise the Lord for that. And so uh, we see, fifth of all, because he sent salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about uh, a, a statue made out of wood, stone, uh, some idol that you can not, that you cannot think, smell, taste, hear, breathe. I'm speaking of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And there was no God the Father, there would be no God the Son. So God the Son, when there would be no salvation, no forgiveness of sins, uh, no victory uh, over sin, no hope for victory over death, and no future in heaven. In John 11, verse 25, the Bible says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that... Believe in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 1, there is a, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, but it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality the light through the gospel. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, and he's the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In John 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So how do I know that there's a God? Because he speaks to sinners. And things like, and I can't tell you uh, how God does it, but God will speak to sinners. And uh, if you're close to God, God may be close to you. But the Bible says, "Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you." And if you want to know God, seek Him with all your heart. I think it's so important. And uh, you, you, the Bible says, "You'll find me." So. I think about how people have been spoken to by God and people that weren't looking for God 
didn't care about God. My our son Tim, his testimony was I wanted to get back with family. He was away from us for five years. He said, I want to get back with family, but I wasn't looking to be saved. That's fine. God always has different plans. And he put that plan in action, and Tim got saved. So there's something unexplainable how God speaks to man. God uses preaching to convict men of their sins. God continues to speak to hearts even after preaching. And why do I know men who had their Sundays ruined simply because their family went to church? God convict them for not going. And that's happened many times. And folks who are miserable throughout a Sunday because God of heaven has spoken to them again about the need of Christ, yet they rejected it again. Now notice a couple of verses here. We'll close. Let's look in Acts chapter 2, please. Acts chapter 2. In verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and sent unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for or because the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now notice if you would, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same thing there added unto them about 3,000 souls. This is the right way to respond. Respond to the Lord. And then notice in Acts chapter 7. Let's turn there. Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. And the Bible says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now notice in Acts chapter 2, they were pricked in the heart. But here they were cut to the heart. And the Bible says, and they gnashed on, on him with their teeth. They actually bit him. I saw how angry they were with, with him. So this is the wrong way to respond. And behold, beloved, I, I don't believe there's a God. I know there is. I talk to him. He speaks to me. I walk with him. He comforts me and, and fellowship with me. I pray to him. He answers my prayer. And I, I, I know him. And he knows all about me. So don't leave here uh, today without the thought of receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So you say, preacher, what if I don't? Well, it's the rapture take place. Death could happen. You know, I'm innocent. I, I'm cleansed in that one sense. I don't have your blood on my hands. I've told the Lord about, you know, what I'm preaching today, and he knows all about it, and I trust God was glorified in it. So let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask God to continue to speak to our hearts. Father, thank you so much for this time, and thank you, Lord, for your, your people. Thank you for the unsaved. And I pray for them, Father concerning their soul. I pray you bless and do a great work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, heads are bowed, eyes are closed.